Whoever you are, wherever you are, and whenever it is, you are catching some brain waves coming to you from the banks of the glorious St. Vrain River in almost always sunny Longmont, Colorado. I'm Ben Kalb, and across the table is the least average co-host I've ever hosted a show with. Aww. She's Becky Peters. Becky, what's good? Thanks, Ben. It's all good. I'm crazy lucky to have the chance to bring the advice of giants into the earbuds of my favorite people, busy teachers, all to make us more informed, inspired, and connected educators. We We've finally t- chased down a giant that we've had on our radar for a long time. In this episode, we speak with Todd Rose, who is the brilliant author of the best-selling books The End of Average and Dark Horse. He's a faculty member at Harvard School of Education and is the former director of the Mind, Brain, and Education program there. There's so much in Todd's work that challenged our thinking and set the stage for this discussion, so we want to share a few of our favorite learnings from his work before we kick into the interview. So Ben, start us off. Absolutely. We heard about him. John Couch had done some work yeah. with him, right? Yeah, that's so right. That's right. Go back and check that episode if you are interested. Uh, so yeah, I binged End of Average on audiobook, and I really listened to it faster than even Harry Potter, and I found myself constantly rewinding and re-listening and writing stuff down because it was just so, like there were so many aha moments and moments that you like audibly were like, whoa. That's, yeah, me that, too. That's me crazy. Too. Uh, I think my favorite line of the book that really sums up the whole thing is most of us know intuitively that a score on a personality test, a rank on a standardized assessment, a grade point average, or a rating on a performance review doesn't reflect your or your child's or your student's or your employee's abilities. Yet the concept of average as a yardstick for measuring individuals has been so thoroughly ingrained in our minds that we rarely question it seriously. Uh, He really says average is like a fake construct that we have made up, but it's such a daily part of our grind, of our work, that we never even question it. Uh, He goes on and says even more boldly, our modern conception of the average person is not a mathematical truth, but a human invention created a century and a half ago by two European scientists to solve the social problems of their era. So those are just two mic drop moments for me in that book. Uh, We've all heard it said that like no two snowflakes are alike. Did you know that, Becky? Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's a total fact. I know a lot about snow. Lived in Illinois. Uh, and like we would never typify like a snowflake and be like, this is, you know, a Myers-Briggs, yeah, this yeah. kind of snowflake. Or yeah. like here's an Enneagram test for snowflakes. And Todd really presents in his book that like we are infinitely more complex than even snowflakes, yet we always are like, you know, typifying us and saying like, hey, this is a – uh, an extroverted kid. This is a real yep. hard worker, ki- working kid with a lot of grit. And we know a lot of those traits are really subjected to like the context that those happen in it. Like I might be a struggling reader when I read about mechanics of a car engine, but not when I read about basketball. So totally. Yeah, absolutely. Blew That's my totally mind. true. I, I, I remember having the same kind of reactions. I read this book a number of years ago. Um, and there's some really cool stories in it that we're going to share with you, but definitely go and check it out. Um, but we live in an era where we can collect data and do so much with it. And I'm going to quote again from the book. It's not that average is never useful. Averages have their place. If you're comparing two different groups of people, like comparing the performance of Chilean pilots with French pilots, as opposed to comparing two individuals from each of those groups, then the average can be useful. But the moment you need a pilot or a plumber or a doctor, the moment you need to teach this child or decide whether to hire that employee, the moment you need to make a decision about any individual, the average is useless. He continues to say, I'm, I'm still quoting here, worse than useless, in fact, because it creates the illusion of knowledge, when in fact, the average disguises what is most important about an individual, end quote. And I, I think about it too, like it's just one of our um, sort of implicit biases or one of our heuristics that we kind of go to those averages really quickly and we need to be careful about it. There's a story from the beginning of his book that will illustrate, and I, it, I always think of it, it helps me really picture this. I, I'll link it in show notes because it's a fascinating story, but they ended up, they had all these crashes uh, with their pilots in the 1940s and they couldn't figure out why they had like even up to like 17 crashes a day and so all these engineers all these people were looking at this problem they looked at human error they looked at possible malfunctions um, they did all of the tests that they possibly could on the machinery the pilots weren't making mistakes etc they evaluated all these things and they came up empty-handed finally they came back to the cockpit itself and what one engineer rediscovered is that when they designed the cockpit in 1926 they did so based on the average measurements of a hundred male pilots 
pilots because there weren't female pilots back then. So for the next three decades, all the dimensions of the cockpit, the, sh- the size of the seat, the shape of the seat, the distance to the pedals and the stick, like imagining a car, it's all the same, right? Um, the height of the windshield, even the shape of the helmets were all built to conform to the average dimensions of a 1926 pilot based on 100 males, right? Long story short, one engineer decided to figure out how many male pilots actually fit within, like even say 30% of the average measurements, okay? So he did this for 10 dimensions with 4,000 people and none of them, zero fit into all 10, fit average all 10, crazy, right? And even like a 30% one way or another. But once they started in putting like customizable and adjustable features like we have in cars, you can move the seat up, down, sideways, whatever, not sideways, <laughs> um, like you have in your car, they had so much better outcomes. So I've been trying to think about ever since I read it, how to apply this to the work of teachers. Like, do we not think about the mean when we make decisions? At some point, don't we try to do what's best for the most people? Like, isn't that kind of our job? Like, how are most students going to learn about this? So I know there's philosophical arguments against utilitarianism, but isn't our job as educators to do the greatest good for the greatest number of kids? So how I've started to reconcile this in my head is that We use the average to make broad choices, like even listening to our episode with Natalie Wexler and her advice on the best way to teach reading to most kids is going to be to do it in a knowledge rich way. But knowing my kids and their needs and adjusting if that isn't what works best for them in that context in that moment. When we talked to Dr. Rose about jagged profiles, it reminds me how um, she even told us when Natalie Wexler said, nobody has one reading level. Mm -hmm. Like you said before, you're reading on basketball, you're reading on something else, your levels are going to be different. So how do we better understand our own and our students' jagged profiles? We'll talk more about that in our interview. Yeah. And that makes so much sense. Like if I were, if they're like, Hey Ben, build us a a plane. That'd be terrifying. I don't think I could do it, but I would be like, okay, like what's the average size of a normal person and I'll make it. And it makes sense. And that's what he said. It's so ingrained in us. And I think back one of the lines that comes in my mind is ringing in my ears is when we talked to Cornelius Minor and he just said, our job as educators is to find the poetry in every kid. And what is it that makes them different? And then making sure that our instruction and our choices are aligned to those differences. And so I've been trying to think about that a lot. Uh, And that's where like voice and choice and empowerment of our learners comes in, knowing that there's poetry in them, that they are so unique in that class and that no two kids are ever alike and there's no types of kids. Um, I've even been thinking about like this podcast. Becky, we host a podcast. Oh, no, no way. We do. And people we, listen to this. I it's believe, not just for you and me. It, no, so. <laughs> it'd be, yeah, sometimes it feels like that. Uh, <laughs> When we created this podcast, we kind of sought out the average. Like, what's the average length of drive you have to work? What is um, your average time that that you have free? And so we based it on average, thinking that the average teacher has a drive to work, that they like to do multiple things at once, like clean the dishes or clean the house or whatever, and listen – but if we if that's our only prescription in the only thing that we offer, we're coming up short. And we, we hear all the time from people who are like, hey, I just I get so distracted when I listen. I would much rather read. And so mm-hmm. Becky works super hard to make these awesome transcripts that you can check out oh, uh, and the show notes. And so I think it's all about um, really designing everything we do for one person, knowing that that'll benefit a lot of people. I think back to our, our conversation with Kimi Thorderson, and she was talking to us uh, about design thinking and the evolution of the can opener and how the can opener that we're used to now, it used to have like really like kind of stinky little handles that you could hardly hold on to. And, and there was an elderly person who couldn't cook for her husband anymore oh, that's right. and wrote in and was like, hey, 3M, can you make me a specialized grip for this? And the 3M designer threw handlebars from a bike onto the can opener, and it was perfectly designed for her jagged profile, but it benefited everyone else as well. And so when we design for one, we design for all, and we need to remember that. Oh, that's beautiful. So just one more piece of front-loading from Todd's work, and it goes a little bit away from the end of average. So he wrote that book, talked about how um, average is a fake construct and that it can be useful sometimes, but then also harmful sometimes. And we'll talk to him more about that in the interview. But he also wrote a book called Dark Horse. Um, Um, And in this book, he studies men and women who take completely unaveraged paths to success and happiness in ways that nobody could have seen coming. Um, In studying countless dark horses, Todd noticed a few commonalities amongst these people who have blazed their own trail to happiness and prosperity. And for the most part, we want to just kind of tell you guys the the four things that he found. For the most part, they all, first of all, knew their micro motivations, which we'll talk to him about what those mean. 
Second thing is they understood choice and saw choices everywhere. And he writes that choice is the lifeblood of fulfillment. Third, they knew their strategies, how they knew how they would be most successful. And then fourth, they ignored the destination. They focused more on the journey. So that's just a little bit of front loading. Another really great book to look at if you're interested in his work after his interview. Um, but we know you'll learn a ton from this completely unaverage Mr. Tad Rose. So without further ado, here he is. When is average a useful metric and when is it not? Uh, that's a great question. So averages are really, really useful when all you care about is the population. So the second you want to make any claims about a particular individual, uh, group averages are just not the right metric. And so to put a finer point on it, like if you're a sociologist, averages are really great. And if you're a psychologist, a neuroscientist, an educator, they're actually pretty bad. Can you talk a little bit about when can designing for average actually be harmful? Like in, in one of those professions, maybe specifically, and you know, we've got an educator audience, so never be afraid to use that metaphor. Yeah, sure. You know, we've explored this in, in a whole bunch of different fields, right? So everything from how you design cockpits in an airplane to, frankly, how, how you think about the design of a car, um, the automobiles and airbag deployment and all that kind of stuff, all the way up to like how we think about clothing uh, sizes, which <laughs> don't work very well either. But if you think about it closer to home in education, most everything we've done in, um, let's take textbooks, right? Believe it or not, like like basically we're like the last industry that still actually incentivizes average-based design. And we, we call it like developmentally appropriate or age appropriate, right? So, which is like a fancy way of saying, if you take like a fourth grade classroom and we say, okay, we want we want a textbook or we want, you know, a piece of curriculum. And what does the average fourth grader know and what should we expect them to be able to do? And then people design for that and then they sell it to us, right? And the problem is, is that as we've shown over and over again, there actually isn't an average person. It, it, it's not a bumper sticker. It's just like a, a scientific fact. Well, okay, if there's no average fourth grader, well, then having a piece of curriculum that assumes an average level of vocabulary or reading ability or background knowledge or you name it means it's actually not going to be a particularly good fit for anyone. And in education, what that really means is we've dumped it on the teacher to have to carry that mess, right? So the the, the environment we've created isn't doing its job. It's, it's not doing its fair share. And the thing I dislike the most is when we we look at those environments and our response is, well, to the teacher, differentiate your instruction, right? It's like, or, you know, here's a here's a crazy idea. How about we actually design a better environment and leave the high value uh, human relationship aspect to the teacher and the student? So, so you, yeah, I love how you say that let's move beyond the bumper sticker, that it's more than just a bumper sticker. So what are some ways that we can overcome that? Like, okay, you're a really different special snowflake. You aren't average. Like, how can we substantiate that claim that really there is no average? Yeah, look, that's a good point. Like, the last thing we need to do is go from a standardized system that treats us as borderline anonymous to one where we're pretending we're all snowflakes. I mean, I guess, like, in the final analysis, that might be true, but it's not very helpful for building systems and especially systems at scale. So, the way that I think about it is when we think about an individual kid, like the idea that like this is not shocking to any educator, man, kids have different constellations of strengths and, and, and weaknesses. They have different things that they're interested in and that we don't really, I mean, I think teachers do work really hard to actually understand that, but the system doesn't really take that into account. Really, honestly, everything about the system is designed to assume that like, one size fits all actually works. When we think about, we don't need to go to like catering to kids every whim, right? That's not helpful really for anyone, but it is it is taking into account the fact that kids will show up with different patterns of strengths and weaknesses and interests, and we need to make that fundamental to what we do. Can you take that then into telling us a little bit about the jaggedness principle and how it's useful to identify like our own jagged profiles and how we can better do that for the students in our rooms? Yeah, the, the, the jagged profile is like probably the most important concept in the science of individuality. And it's like simply stated as this, like on any human characteristic that you care about, anything, people can't be reduced to a single score because you're full of multiple dimensions and those dimensions don't really correlate like we think. So if we use like body size as one quick example, 
like it's nice to think there's like small, medium, large, extra large people. That's not how it works. But in our head, we almost think of it like nested Russian dolls, right? Like, like the, the, the small person is like just a miniature version of the medium person. But in reality, when you actually measure people, and we've done this in the military has done it. Uh, the clothing manufacturers association of Canada has done it from all the Canadians. Like look at, look at everybody's dimensions, like height, weight, chest circumference, hips, everything. What you're kind of in your head assuming is like, that people are more or less like if you're in the 70th percentile on height, that you're probably going to be in the 70th percentile or close to it in most things. But even just thinking about that, you realize that's definitely not true because like the tallest person, you know, isn't necessarily the heaviest person, you know, right. And like it, yeah. it turns out we've known for about 60 years that this is how it works is like, they're just not that correlated. So you could be tall and heavy, tall and skinny. You can have broad shoulders or not. You can. So in size, when we map out, your body size, every single person ends up having this jagged profile. Well, where they'll be on the high end on some things in it, right in the middle on some others and on the low end on some things like every single person. In fact, we've literally in like tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of people, if you include all the clothing manufacturer stuff, we've never found someone that is like straight down the line. You know, they're just, it doesn't, that person doesn't exist. And so it would be kind of a interesting story to talk about it in just in terms of body size, but that same principle uh, holds in every other characteristic where we've looked, including looking at people's character, including their intelligence, um, their aptitudes. Uh, it's just people are going to be jagged. And so when when I think about that, like, what does that mean? Well, besides the fact that, number one, it's the baseline for how you would design a flexible environment, right? Like, okay, how do people vary? Well, let's make sure there's flexibility in the environment that responds to that. But in terms of self-knowledge, right? Like, You've got to know that about yourself and, and, and teachers have to know that first of all about themselves, which also we often forget, right? The the self-knowledge on the teacher's part is pretty important, but, but also knowing that about the kids. One of the things that you can do in like, if people have already taken some of these assessments, including IQ tests, like it's funny, we immediately go to like, well, my IQ is like a hundred, whatever, name the number. And it's like, that is like the least useful thing you could imagine. All that mat- that matters is the pattern beneath it, right? So looking at what what am I actually sort of naturally good at? You know, what am I what am I not likely good at? And like, what does that mean for me? So what's I think is like critically important is just because we know this about your individuality, like you've got to believe that all kids are capable. I know that seems almost like, well, duh, but you'd be shocked at how many people are like, no, nope, no, nope, there's like a talented 10th, right? There's like some kids are just smarter than other kids. And you're like, okay, well, if that's what you believe, then you're going to take this individuality and you're going to use it to be better at selection, right? At finding the smarter pattern of jagged profiles, right? But what I would argue is like, in fact, every time we've ever entered a, a, an education environment where we have assumed all kids are capable and we've built environments assuming that, kids do amazing things. And that goes all the way back to like Benjamin Bloom and mastery based learning and, you know, whatever. But the idea is if you assume all kids are capable, then the importance of a jagged profile and understanding that is, okay, wait, this is who I am right now. And how do I pick the right kind of strategies and supports that allow me to accomplish the things that I care about? Right. And in in that sense, it really matters a lot. Like, for example, me personally, I have absolutely terrible working memory, which means like if we were talking right now and you said, hey, when, when we're done, could you remember to send me a paper or something? There is like a 50-50 chance that never happens, right? Now, I could like you could pathologize it and say, okay, you have a working memory disorder. Or we say, well, wait a minute. That is, that's one part of many dimensions of who I am. How do I deal with that? Well, I have, a, I have technology. I have an organizational system, which makes it so that it's not an issue, right? So if you use this jagged profile as a starting point, for exploring who you are and understanding that it is not deterministic, right? Just because you have a certain pattern doesn't mean anything. It just means like thinking about the right kind of strategies and supports that you need to uh, reach high levels of, of achievement. And I loved how you talk about in your next book, uh, Dark Horse, how the jaggedness really does also lend itself to the third you know, principle that you found Dark Horses have in common, which is uh, dark horses figure out that what are their strategies and strengths that work for them. So when you threw the pencil at your dad, 
Um, how did that kind of demonstrate your jaggedness and help you actually get to where you are today? Where you are today? Well, that one demonstrated that I was not a very nice person all the time. And that was probably not the way to, to draw attention to myself. But yeah, so the story is like, and it, it's comical. Every time I tell the story, I think, wow, like how close I came to like not being able to live the life that I was capable of living, right? You know, I'd filled out of high school. I had uh, decided to go to college at night and I'd worked my way through and I'd done well enough that suddenly I was thinking my advisors were saying, hey, you should go to grad school. And I, you know, nobody in my family had ever gone to, only my dad had gone to college and no one had gone to grad school. So I didn't really know what that was or what it took, but I trusted them. And so that meant I had to take the GRE, which I am absolutely terrible at standardized assessments. I, I, I despise them for a whole bunch of reasons, but so I was like, okay, but I've got the grades. I've, I've published my own research and like, this should work. And okay, fine. I, I enrolled in one of those practice courses where they have a, a, a professor or whom, and so basically it's someone who, who aced the, the GRE and they teach you all their secrets. Right. And, um, I'd been doing that for like every Saturday for like, I don't know, seven weeks or so, eight weeks. And, it was like about I don't know, a month before you have to take the jury. And, and what's funny is back then it had like the verbal section, the quantitative section, and then this like analytical reasoning, which thank goodness they got rid of. And now they just have a writing section. But like that, that one was like the old ones that'd be like, okay, farmer John, right. Has like six rows that he can plant stuff in. And he has peas and carrots and corn and like, the rules are peas can't be next to carrots and carrots have to be in the third spot. And, and then they're like, what's in row two slot three. And I, I, now I, I already told you that I like have pretty terrible working memory. So holding all that in mind, like it was insane. Like no matter how hard I tried, you know, I had done a lot better on the quantitative, a lot better on the verbal. I, I swear to you up until that point, I had never gotten higher than the 13th percentile on a practice exam on the analytical reasoning. And, I was getting desperate. Like, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, after all that hard work, I'm going to get, like, failed by, like, not being able to do this one thing, right? This this analytical reasoning. And, yeah. I, and I thought, like, well, that's, what do you do, right? And I, I really just thought, like, okay, well, I guess grad school's not really going to happen. And I was in my at my parents' house because we, well, my wife and our kids, we had, like, a 400-square-foot apartment, so you can't get much studying done there. And I'm sitting at the the dining table and my dad had come home and I'd been sitting there for quite a while working through practice ones and it just wasn't getting better. And I just got frustrated and and I like just kind of flipped my pencil across the room in like frustration. Again, I would, wouldn't recommend it. And my dad happened to walk in at the time. And I mean, it just like whizzed past him. He did not like that. Right. And he was like, what's, what's wrong with you? Like throw pencils around my house. And I, luckily I told him, I said, look, I, I don't get this. I don't understand why this is so hard. And he happened to come over and he's an engineer by training. And he said, Oh, that's a, this is a degrees of freedom problem. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what that means, but like, it's really hard. Right. And like, he's like, well, tell me how you're doing it. And I was telling him and I, I was doing it in my head. Right. And cause that's the way the, the person who running the class did it and he got a perfect score. So, you know, seems like that's the right strategy. And, um, and he goes, well, but you, you, you're, we all know you have terrible working memory. Like, why in the world would you do it in your head? And he goes, hey, look, here's a better way. Get it out of your head and get it on paper. And he said, if you'd use this diagram, and he showed me a way to uh, grid out things. And he said, if you use this grid, it will work on everything. And I was like, that that can't be true. Like, that just seems like too too easy, right? But I, I was, like I said, I was in like the 13th percentile. So what did I have to lose, right? So so I tried it on the first one. And it was like drop dead, like stupidly easy. And I'm like, that's a fluke, right? And I tried it again and it kept getting working. I'm like, hold on. So then I, I went back um, the next Saturday. That was like a Thursday. And I went to my professor and I said, okay, hold on. Let me show you something. And you tell me why this is just like spectacularly wrong. And I showed him, he goes, oh yeah, yeah yeah, you can do it that way if you want. And I'm like, what? Oh Wait. And and of course, how is he going to know, right? He gets a perfect score and he has great memory, as it turns out, after I talked to him about it. The the funny thing is, is flash forward, like just a few weeks later, I mean, it was somewhere like two, two or three weeks, I can't remember exactly, but I actually only missed like one question on the entire analytical reasoning section. And it ended up being my best score 
And so it's so funny, right? And like that for sure that had a made a difference of getting into Harvard. I mean, I am had having been on the admissions committee now for 15 years, <laughs> like I, I don't think we're admitting someone with a 13th percentile score. Like it's just I mean, I don't think we should judge people that way, but we do. So I'm like, hold on. So wait, am I so is it a strength of mine? Am I am I super analytical or no? And then you realize the obvious answer is all performance is a combination of aptitude and strategy. And we often don't teach kids that. We don't, we, they, they just think it's about innate ability, right? So when you bump into something that you're not just automatically good at, you think, well, then I'm not, I'm not talented at it, right? That's it. Versus there, like for anything you want to accomplish, there's always more than one strategy. Always. It is a guarantee, right? And the one that's going to work for you is the one that fits your individuality. And so to the dark horse point, one of the things that was amazing, and I just really like, I, I didn't hadn't connected the dots even for, for my own life until uh, studying these folks is that they will do things like as soon as they figure out what they what they care about and, and, and they're pursuing it and they're trying to get better, they will hit something and like they will it looks like they're spinning their wheels like they they looks like they're not making progress but what they're doing is trying and discarding strategies until they find the one that works and then they'll just take off. And it is remarkable, right? It is so cool. And, and I think from a personal standpoint, right, if you realized that there is for sure a strategy that fits for you, if you'll take the time to find it, that is such a nice way of thinking about what's possible for you in your life. So that it's like, look, it, rather than just keep doing more of the same, well, that's that's like Einstein was that like the, the definition of insanity, right? Like expecting a different result, doing the exact same thing over and over again. If you realize it's about finding strategies, like figure out who's done this well, look at how they did it, and you'll be shocked at how diverse the strategies are. Try them out. That's all you can do. And you'll find one that clicks and you'll be shocked at what you're capable of. Interesting. So as I'm hearing you talk about this, I think that a lot of people try to take sort of a a side or a shortcut to figuring out what our own jagged profiles are through things like personality tests or, you know, how are how are those not useful metrics for predicting our behavior? And like, because I think it's, I don't know. Yeah. You talk about it. I'm curious. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to start by saying like, look, there's all these assessments, look at the underlying pattern, right? I'm not, I'm not opposed to that as a starting point and things like personality tests. There's some challenges with them. I don't mind ones that don't try to put a value judgment on the pattern. So, you know, you take something like the Myers-Briggs, there's some serious <laughs> problems with like, there's like a basically a, a 50-50 probability that like if you retake it, you'll have a different <laughs> result. So it, you don't want to put too much stock into it. But like one thing it does really well is it was one of the first tests that didn't try to say, hey, there's a better personality and a worse personality, right? There's just like you need to understand where you're at and understand that teams, you know, con- consisting of lots of different kinds of patterns are actually better. And And so I think, you know, they deserve a lot of credit for that kind of stuff. But if you want to live the life you want to live, you got to know a couple of things. You do need to know what you're good at, right? Like it's super hard to, to like be, live a fulfilling life doing things you're terrible at. The thing we often forget is that's actually not even the most important thing. Like you need to know what actually matters to you. You got to know what motivates you, right? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Because if you get that wrong, all the achievement in the world will be hollow, You'll just, if something won't feel right, you'll be like, great, yeah, look, I make lots of money now and I've got all these awards, but it just, it feels empty, right? So you've got to, mm-hmm. you've got to be doing things like for us, like a fulfilling life is achievement against things that actually matter to you, right? Achieving on things that that align to your values and your motives. So to me, that first step is as much about understanding what really motivates you and the bad news is that it's incredibly individual, like shockingly, like I cannot believe how different people are in what truly drives them. The good news is it's actually relatively straightforward to get on the path to figure that out. By that, I mean, like if you want the fastest shortcut for you or for your student or for your your children, start by asking what are some of the things that I actually enjoy doing? We can do play the opposite one, which is stuff you hate, which also works, but like we'll stay positive. What do you enjoy doing? And then here's the kicker is it, the question of why is everything. We often do this if we talk to our kids at all. It's like, hey, how was school? Or hey, okay, you like football? Oh, I love football. Okay, great. Football is your passion. Well, kind of. That that That's sort of good to know, but like if you understand why, right? So there's lots of reasons why people could enjoy football. I, I love football. 
But is it like because you like being outdoors? Is it you like the physical exercise? Is it the fact that it's, it's uh, it has a lot of strategy involved, that it's a team sport? If you understand that and you do that over and over again on the things that feel right to you, that you really enjoy, you'll start to see the commonalities. And wh- why that's super important, we call them micro motives, actually, because of their specificity. It was just absurdly specific. But if you know those things, if I if all I know is like I'm passionate about football, well, what happens when I can't play football anymore by choice or you know, they just won't let me? I'm not good enough. It's like you end up having like this midlife crisis or something. You're like, what do I do with my life? If you understood the underlying motives that were being the boxes that were being checked by that, that's portable, right? I could say, well, what other things can I do that actually also like satisfy these motives? And one of the things with dark horses is, is that they were so unbelievably good at knowing what truly mattered to them um, that they could make choices that put them in situations that gave them a, a, a pretty good shot at doing things that were fulfilling. So all of those things are kind of coming together for me as I'm listening to you talk about it. One of my favorite parts in Dark Horse is about like the if-then signatures and and you're not going to be, I mean, even if the Myers-Briggs tells you you're extroverted, it's, you know, it's only in certain situations, like we're situationists. Um, And I I was, so I want to hear you talk about that, but also then the game of judgment when you're trying to realize your own micro motivations. Can you talk about how to walk through that? Yeah, the the if-then signatures first. So this is the problem with most of those like personality assessments, which is, even if they get the dimensions right, let's just let's just pretend that they did, right? And say, hey, wait, this feels like, isn't this like a jagged profile? It's like, sort of, right? So what we find is that actually, like we call it the context principle. And basically it's this, all human behavior, performance, learning, whatever, you cannot understand it unless you understand the immediate environment in which it's happening. Every educator on the planet knows that the environment matters, right? Context matters. Or else, why would you be in the business? <laughs> like, what, what would be the point, right? If, if your work literally didn't matter, right? In terms of creating environments for kids to thrive. But psychology, on the other hand, we have been absolutely obsessed with traits, right? We hated the fact that context mattered. So it was like, we, uh, you know, it's like, okay, well, let's just pretend there's this like essence of you that sort of floats above every context, And we'll sort of average across all those things and we'll like, hey, here you go, right? And like what we found is that it's just not true. And there's some really specific things that just kind of blew my mind in terms of the research is like, for example, uh, one of my colleagues, Yuishi Shoda at the University of Washington, he was studying kids who had been diagnosed as having like high levels of aggression, right? And quite literally on an assessment, right? Okay, you're above the 70th percentile in aggressive behavior, so you have a problem, right? And they actually were at like a summer camp for aggressive kids, which kind of, I just wanted to be there. That seemed like kind of amazing, but um, <laughs> like, 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 yeah, that's just, uh, it's like uh, Lord of the flies kind of, you know, but, but the, um, the, but what was so fascinating is, okay. So what uh, Dr. Shota did was like said, well, wait a minute, the, the context has to matter. Let's, let's actually like measure it. And what they did was they would actually observe kids and their aggressive behavior in a whole bunch of different meaningful contexts. So in in classrooms with the teachers, um, on the playground, in the cafeteria, right? And they found something pretty remarkable, which was this. So if you took two kids and say they both have the same averaged percentile score, like, okay, they're both in the 75th percentile on aggression. What you'd find is that one kid would be hyper aggressive, but only in like the classroom with like a male teacher, And the other kid would be docile there, but super aggressive with their peers on the playground. And you find that pattern over and over again. So that like what what, what was so powerful and interesting and what I love is that historically personality tests have suffered from like we call like the 0.3 crisis, which is like these things that are meant to like explain your behavior, right? Otherwise, what's the point of it? They, They like routinely fail to correlate with actual behavior above like a 0.3, which is in statistical terms is you're only explaining like 9% of the variance in behavior. So it's like, you, you know, nothing, right? And it was so puzzling to people like, why, if we know their personality scores, does it not, does it not help us predict how they'll behave? And what we found is if you take these if then signatures instead, right? If I know, for example, that I am extroverted with people that I know, but I become introverted in a crowd. Well, that is an incredibly reliable pattern. It is, it, we can predict with like, eerie accuracy how you're going to behave if I know that you're going to be around a bunch of people you don't know, right? Which makes a lot of sense if you think about it, right? And as parents, we kind of know this, right? In fact, when we have young kids, 
we, we actually know the context matters. So let's say your kids throw on a temper tantrum, like it's okay. She didn't, she hasn't taken her nap yet. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's a matters. It's just, we, we've been behind the curve in psychology. We didn't have the tools. We didn't have the technology. Now we do. We know this is true. Everything is contextualized. Even, yeah. even in medicine, our ability to diagnose cancer, we are now recognizing these micro environments are really fundamental to being able to accurately and quickly diagnose it. That's pretty fundamental. Um, so that's the, my long-winded uh, context answer to your other question about the game of judgment. So that's kind of like the flip side of like, what do you like to do? We were trying to look at like, what's, an, what's a quick way that people can intuitively start to, to sort of ferret out the, the things that really matter to them? Because we almost never teach people to do this. And so one of the things is that like, we judge people all the time. If I'm walking past someone and I see they're, they're doing a job, let's just say they're working at McDonald's or something. I'm like, oh, like for me, I can't imagine, although I did actually work at places like that, but like, so now I know why I don't want to do it. But like, you're like, oh, I would never do that. But you ought, usually think you're that it's telling you something about that person. But in reality, it's just completely shining a, a, a light internally, right? Like, why? Like, instead of just being like, well, I've judged that person. They, I don't like them or I don't like this. Why? Like, what is it about that that you, you makes that not great, right? Or, or the flip side is, hey, wow, look. I'm really envious of this person or oh my, I love what they do. Why? What is it? Right? What is it? Is it, do you like that person because they're famous or because they get to like have more autonomy in their work or they're creative? Really just digging a little bit into that um, and realizing that it is not telling you about them at all. It is like telling you about the blinking lights of your own motive, uh, motivations. Um, the reason I liked that game is I feel like it's super hard not to judge people. And once you realize it's not actually judging them, it's judging yourself, uh, it can be constructive. Wow. So dark horses know their micro motivations. I think there's a ton of ways that as teachers, we can take that advice and start to help our students identify what are their micro motivations. But I thought another point from dark horses that's really applicable in the classroom is your idea that choice is the lifeblood of fulfillment. So um, how do dark horses utilize the power of choice and how should we encourage that with our kids? That's a great question. Yeah, no, it, look, and choice is a funny thing, right? Because especially in like more personalized learning environments, we tend to think, right, just give kids more choice. It's like, sort of, <laughs> right? Like that's that's definitely part of it. But yeah, the, the, the aspect of it being so important is like, sure. So let's say I know my micro motives, but Choice is the way I turn that into purpose, right? It is how I put it into action. The thing that was like really remarkable to me, I mean, just like, I just couldn't believe how good they were at this is like how they thought about choice, in particular, how they thought about like risk. And we tend to like, without realizing it, we've tend to adopt an average based approach to risk. So if I told you, well, only like one in 20 people ever get a job in Silicon Valley, well, you'd be like, wow, okay, that's, that's a pretty risky thing if that's... But it's like, yeah, on average across everybody that tries, like that's probably true. But like if you're making decisions based on who you really are, right, what matters to you, what you're good at, the risk probability is not across everybody. It doesn't make any sense, right? Like probably the most important thing, if I could convey one thing about how dark horses make choices, it is this idea of, yes, on the one hand, they are looking for the option that actually aligns most to who they are, right? Their micro motives, their, their abilities. So they're looking for the best fit, right? Um, but look, as someone who, you know, got married when I was 19 and was on welfare for a few years, like I never really liked the idea of like, find your fit or I'm like, yeah, sure. Except for like, what if I can't do that thing, right? Like, it's not that helpful to tell me to fall my bliss off a cliff, right? So what was so fascinating about this though, is that like what they would do and it came up over and over again is like, they'd be looking for the best fit. And then there's a second part to this is they would say like, what's the worst case scenario if I make this choice? And if you can't live with that worst case scenario, then you don't make that choice, right? You move on to the next best fit with the worst case scenario that you can live with, because then what's the risk? I mean, really, like what's the risk? If you can live, like if worst case scenario for me of, you know, leaving my job at the university and starting my own think tank is my children will go without food. I'm unwilling to do that. Right. And mm -hmm. it's just frankly irresponsible. But if, 
the worst case is, you know, a little bit of a bump in the road and yeah, okay, I got to live off save it, whatever, you know, if I can live with it, then it really actually isn't very risky. And I thought that was so enlightening, right? About how you make responsible decisions that allow you to continue to progress toward more and more fulfilling life. Hmm. That's fascinating. And I'm, I'm curious, both with your research in that and also with, you know, your work at the Mind Brain uh, Education Institute at Harvard and with your think tank, what, like in your view, what would an ideal classroom or even public education system look like in a dark horse model as opposed to an average one? The first thing is that they're not going to look the same, right? Like, I, I think one of the biggest problems I have is that, like, there's just a lack of pluralism in public education, right? Right? Like, if context matters and people are different, well, it's not surprising communities would be different too. And yet we've locked everybody into like basically the same exact thing, the same way at the same time. Right. And I get why we did it. I get it. Right. You know, a hundred years ago. And I even get why we had to do it 50 years ago. But when now we have a chance to think about, wait a minute, some of the assumptions we'd made back then turn out not to be true about the way we think about kids right? The average assumption is wrong. The human potential assumption is wrong. Like we really had a very, very narrow, dark view of human potential back then. The founders of of educational psychology, like Edward Thorndike, literally believed it was impossible for all kids to go to high school because they just didn't have the intelligence, right? And you're like, this is the guy that's like setting the whole system up for us, right? Like, I think we now know that what one kid can do, most kids can do under highly favorable conditions. And that We now live in a world where we can make better use of the broader range of natural talents kids have. Uh, There aren't just three jobs that are good and we're all fighting for them, right? Like if you're good at something, odds are we can turn that into productive work and and you can make a contribution off of it. So I believe that that changes the task, right? And I think it actually gets us closer to what almost every teacher I've ever met went into the business for, not classroom management, not testing. It was to develop kids. And so I think our obligation now is to say, <clears throat> look, yes, there are things that kids need to learn, right? Like, I'm not saying this is, again, Lord of the Flies, whatever you want to do. Although, look, some people argue that's okay. Our obligation is to understand each student as an individual child. That doesn't mean they're in isolation. It doesn't mean selfishness, right? They're, we're deeply connected to each other and it matters. But there's a dignity and worth to every mm-hmm. kid. And they all have something to contribute. And if you believe that, then the task is developing them, right? It's not ranking and sorting them. So what we need are environments that have a flexibility so that they they are capable of being good fits for a broader range of kids, right? Um, so m- for me, that comes into like things like universal design for learning should be like a staple for any environment, right? They have We know how to do this. But then the thing is, is like, okay, well, wait, if we really want to develop kids who know who they are, know what they're good at, what they're passionate about, and have a productive next step when they leave us. Well, to me, if I were king for a day, I would say enough with the bureaucratic, like administrative control of this. Like you either trust your teachers or you don't. Like it it, it is that simple. The, The teachers are the professionals in the room. They're the people whose job it is to take our children and help them become the best version of themselves. And if you think that that you're going to get to a better system by teacher proofing this, we're fooling ourselves, right? And and the truth is is like it's easy to fall into the narrative of blaming teachers, but man, if you spend any time with teachers, you realize these are incredibly passionate, dedicated professionals who know what they're doing. And instead of trying to like box them in and making sure it's like, right, like I'll give you a a concrete example, my goddaughter, who's in like first grade in our local public school here, is doing this math that's just nonsensical. I, I swear to you, I still can't figure out how to solve it. Now, maybe that says more about me. And the teacher's like, yeah, no, this is terrible, but I can't do anything about it. This is how we have to teach it. And I'm like, hold on. We're not going to even empower the teacher to make that decision, right? Um, so for me, it's it's let's put the human relationship at the center of this, right? It is about the child and the teacher. It is about the children with each other. And and let's build the environments that actually accelerate that, right? So that means, mm-hmm. yes, to the extent we need technology, and we do, look, there's no way to do this without the technology, but the technology is in service of this. It is in service of helping the teacher do the job that he or she wants to do, not do it for them, right? Just like it is 
It is not about having algorithms that predict and adapt and tell the kid what to do next because that's nonsensical anyway. It is about stuff that surfaces insights that'll be useful for me as a student to know myself, uh, for my teacher to know me better and to provide recommendations about what we do next. So like some of that seems obvious, but what I get the most worried about is in the rush to do something different that unless we've, unless it's newly invented, it must not be good. Right. But I think most of the stuff that we need to do, we've known for a while now, we just haven't had the ability or the public will to do it. So we could talk to you all day. It looks like we got time for one last question. And I, I have a question about like, how does learning from big data kind of mesh with all that you've taught in average? And like, how can we learn from data? And I noticed on your Twitter profile, you are like the antithesis sports fan of most of our listeners. Uh, we have a bulk of our listeners here in Colorado. We love the Nuggets and the Broncos and you love uh, the Patriots and the Jazz. But I'm curious, and I'd like to ask that question about how we learn from data with the frame of like the analytics movement in sports, Um, because I think that could be a cool analogy. Like, aren't analytics just using average um, situations to you know to make decisions on the sports field? What what do you feel about that? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought this up. It's uh, so I, as a sports fanatic too, like so I've had the pleasure of actually working with some NBA teams and with the NBA in general um, and with like the Pac-12 and some of this where it's like everyone's drowning in data and still doesn't have anything close to like real knowledge. And you realize what they were doing is they just took the same assumptions and they just have more data, right? And it's like garbage in, garbage out, right? You have this ability to actually collect the kind of data you need to understand individuals and teams of individuals, right? And so what's been so fun is as they realize that they're not really predicting any better, you know, one of my, one of my favorite things is, is, you know, talking to the uh, LA Clippers and um, they're, they're really steeped in this too. And, you know, Steve Ballmer bought them, you know, and he used to run Microsoft and like my, my teasing of them was like, you missed a guy named Joe Ingles who you cut and went to the jazz and is like a starter and he's phenomenal. Right. And it's like, you should be building a system to be like, how did that happen? <laughs> right. Like, and one of the things that's been the coolest thing is we did work with Bob Delaney, who was the, was a referee, but also the vice president of referees for the NBA and looking at how do we evaluate refs in the past? We did these weird things, which was like literally the number of missed calls. And then we just rank <laughs> refs. And it's like, but they're working as a team. And what you found really quickly is like, when you ranked refs that way, actually you weren't getting the best refs because what it did was it incentivized selfishness where if the three of us are are refing a game and let's say, you know, you're younger, I can stay in my visual lane and I can maximize my ability to get the calls right on mine. But as a team, we'll be worse off. If I slide over and I help you out a little bit, as a team, we're better off individually, I may my, make a, a few more mistakes. But you realize the, the goal is team performance, right? You want a, a well ref game. We also found individual refs, they're just, you wouldn't be surprised based on what we're talking about. They were susceptible to context effects. So like, it really mattered. The, the right answer of, of who the best ref was is like, it depends. It depends on the other two refs. It depends on uh, the arena you're playing in. It depends on the two teams that are playing. And it also depended on what's at stake. So we were able to build better predictive models that said, look, th- that sounds like a lot of information. You have all that information. It's, it's like quite easy to actually know. And it turned out, now here's what's really fun. It turned out that after all that fancy modeling, you kind of could have already known this simply by asking professional refs you know, that have been there for a while. Hey, why don't you tell us who you think the best refs are? <laughs> And it turns out they they actually have a pretty decent intuitive sense for what it means to be a good referee. And they were far better at, at predicting performance just by that than, than the old analytic models that were using thick data, but using it wrong. And so this has been true for predicting, you know, what, what, what players team should go and, and sign. Um, if you're not modeling a player as a multidimensional player, if you're just looking at their scoring, then you're in trouble. If you're not if you just go, well, look, they average this many points and this many rebounds, right? But what teams did they play against? And like, yeah, you're taking it from the Eastern Conference to the Western Conference where now they're going to play. <laughs> like, it really matters. And so what's been fun is that's made 
that's making great progress because there's billions and billions of dollars on the line. But the same thing holds for education. It, it's not different. If we are collecting more and more data on kids, that's not going to stop. The question is, what do we do with it? What kind of data and what do we do with it? So the biggest thing to me is that as long as we are focused on data, instead of trying to use it as selection, right, as, okay, can we just give them a test and then we know everything about them or whatever. If you're really using it in a formative way, right, what kind of data do we need to help a kid know, like, what, like feedback? What do you do next, right? Does it inform the human interaction, then it's useful, right? I, one of the one of the best analytics things I've been involved with, I, I probably shouldn't name them, but it's a famous kids brand that's really well trusted. But again, I probably should. So we were helping build their digital learning platform and they wanted to embed these analytics and to their everlasting credit, this was for preschool. It was like, yeah, we could use algorithms to like detect when a kid isn't learning very well and what do they do next? And it was like, or, and this is what they did and it was fantastic is, we just use anomaly detection, and rather than try to do something, it just pinged the teacher on an iPad and said, hey, look, you might want to go over and check out Johnny. Don't tell him what to do. Mm-hmm. Just say. And then there are only three responses. The teacher would say, you know what? I didn't even do anything. Don't <laughs> don't worry. Or I went over there, and nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Or, yeah, actually, that was a really helpful thing. And then feed that back into the system and have it get better at surfacing things that that the professionals in the room may want to take a look at without encroaching on their ability to make the decision. So for me, again, let's collect the right kind of data, but more importantly, never, ever, ever, ever let algorithms make decisions, right? <laughs> they can recommend, they can support, but it should be in service of kids knowing more about themselves, teachers knowing more about themselves, more about kids, and that the the human beings in the room need to make the choices. Oh, Todd, <laughs> thank you so much for taking so much time, man. We know you got to run to your next appointment. All right, Becky, let's close up shop. What did you learn? Well, I've been mostly reflecting on the intersection of Todd Rose's work with what we know about teaching and learning. I saw a tweet from Dan Willingham the other day that um, he said, it's not true that all students learn differently, which I totally understand. There are memory processes and processes of knowledge acquisition and consolidation that aim for every human, right? We've got the same bodies. Um, It's like the cockpit of the World War II planes. How you fly the plane is the same, but how you access the controls is different. It's jagged, those jagged profiles. And yes, it's helpful for us to look at average when we're trying to compare performance or how well we're serving our students versus the broader student body across the state or the nation. If we operate in a vacuum, we have no idea if we're giving every kid the best possible education. That's why I appreciate standardized tests. I really find that very useful. But we also need to attend to individuals and realize the unique aspects of how we access knowledge and how we express our learning. Personalization is such a hot and misunderstood topic in education, I think because we're constantly trying to wrestle with that balance between standardization and personalization. And the answer cannot be either or. It's got to be both. Um, And that's what I take away from this conversation. We just need to ask ourselves, what do we lose when we use the average and what do we gain? When is it okay to do that and when is it not? Um, And so I think just being more intentional with how we use the information that we've got and recognizing our own biases uh, when we make those jumps initially. How about you, Ben? Oof, that's all. That's a great connection. I, I saw a ton of connections back to other authors we've had on the show, so that was definitely encouraging and exciting. Uh, one of the things that I've been taking away is that the first concept from Dark Horses of that Dark Horses know their micro-motivations and one of the best questions we can ask our kids uh, in our classrooms or at our homes is why. And so, you know, not just like, hey, you know, what's, what's your favorite sport, but then like drilling down, what, what is it about basketball that you like? And once you notice the little aspects of something that you enjoy, you can really figure out what is it in your career and life that's going to, that you can add in to be happy. So that's something I've been doing with my kids at home, not my kiddos. Yeah. Just my kids. <laughs> Check out you. last episode oh, you're so if, you're, good. if you're curious about that. <laughs> Absolutely. So listeners, how can we get better uh, at customizing this show for your uniqueness and jaggedness? Uh, Hit us up on Twitter at Brainwaves or email us, Becky at Brainwaves.com or Ben at Brainwaves.com and let us know. And as always, have a very unaverage and great generic time of day.